Hopefully you picked up a copy of the outline and they're available in both English and French. One sheet and two sides. We've made two previous studies on the eight mysteries of the New Testament. The first time we covered the introductory material and all the facets of it. There are eight divine mysteries and two satanic ones. Then the following time I spoke at, we dealt with the first of the eight divine mysteries, which is the mystery kingdom found within the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So these are the two things we already covered. What we're going to deal with today is that five of these eight mysteries are all relevant specifically to the church in some way. But keep in mind, the word mystery is not being used in the same sense in scripture as it would be in English, where a mystery is something we don't understand yet, we don't have a solution yet, we don't have an answer to. However, uh, it, in, the new in the usage of, this, of the term, it it's refers to something that was totally unknown, unrevealed anywhere in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, only revealed for the first time in the New Testament. And therefore, what is um, found in the New Testament is something that is now knowable. We understand it now, God revealed it now, but it was something nowhere indicated anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Now the first of these eight mysteries, if you turn to Revelation chapter one, is the mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands. And chapter one verse 20 reads, Uh, the mystery, and there's our word, the mystery of the seven stars which are in the, in the right hand and the mystery of the seven lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now in chapters two and three, he'll be addressing situations in seven different churches in what the ancient world was Asia Minor, today it is modern day Turkey. And um, there were, of these seven churches, there was uh, something wrong in, in five of these churches, nothing wrong in two of these churches. Furthermore, in the last church, is a church that where the Messiah is totally outside, it is claiming to be a typical local church, but it is not a believing local church, but has gone into other matters. So what we know from the first mystery on the church, which is a short discussion here, the sim that the seven stars are the seven angels. But that itself is not the mystery because throughout the Hebrew Bible, whenever the word star is used symbolically, it's always in the symbol of an angel. And that's also true in some usages in the New Testament as well. There may be one exception, but except for that possible exception, whenever you see the word the star used not literally, but um, symbolically, it refers to an angel. It might be holy angels, it may also be fallen angels. But the stars are always symbol of a specific angel of a specific kind. So the seven stars represent um, the seven angels who are the guardians of these seven churches. And furthermore, the reason every local church has its own guardian angel comes out in the statements of chapters two and three that these angels, these are the holy angels and they carry out the blessings of the seven letters of the local church continues acts of obedience, but they also carry out the disciplines of these seven churches. Uh, when God uh, says such and such is not good and therefore must suffer a discipline. And so, that, so each local church, including the congregation right, that we have right now here, there is a guardian angel. Now the seven lampstands, he points out, are the seven congregations, seven churches, seven kehilot. 
The thing to notice though is that there's a distinction here because Israel, if you look at the menorah over here, it's, a lamps, it's one lampstand with seven lights. So that was representative of Israel, so this would not be the mystery. But the mystery is that each individual congregation, each individual body has its own uh, lampstand. And God can also put out the light of the lampstand if it's, if it's necessary for divine discipline. So the real mystery is not the Israel as the uh, menorah that's already revealed in the Hebrew Bible, but the fact that every church begins well and, uh, and is, and is uh, symbolized by an individual lampstand. And because there are seven churches mentioned in chapters two and three, that's why there are seven lampstands and so on. So that's one of these eight divine mysteries dealing specifically with the body of the Messiah or the church. Let's go now to Ephesians chapter three. And you outlined this couple of beam, the mystery of the body in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. We'll take it verse by verse, mostly in summary, till we get to the actual mystery. In verse 1, Paul has become a, a prisoner on behalf of the Gentile believers in the body of the Messiah. He's building on the foundation that he already laid in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Chapter 2, 11 through 22, we're speaking about the union of Jews and Gentiles into one body. Now, the fact of Gentile salvation is not the mystery. The, the fact the Messiah's ministry will include Gentile salvation was already revealed in the Hebrew Bible, such as Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 and verse 6, and chapter 49, verses 1 through 13, among other passages. So Gentile salvation is not the mystery. But the union of Jews and Gentiles into one body, now that is the mystery. And it is this concept of the one body of Jews and Gentiles that led to the persecution against Shaul or Saul or Paul. Now, in verse 2, the knowledge of the dispensation of grace uniquely revealed to Paul. He was the main recipient, not the only recipient, but the main recipient of reaching the, being taught the mysteries of the New Testament. One of these is this one right here in Ephesians 3 verses 1 through 12. The knowledge of the dispensation of grace came uniquely to Paul. It was during this dispensation that the mystery of the church is, has been developed. And so it has. Now in verse 3, he points out that there is a re-emphasis that the mystery church was uniquely revealed to him. And in verse 4, for that reason, he was willing to suffer. So Paul was constrained to proclaim the mystery. This point he makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And furthermore, he considered himself to be the steward of the mysteries of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Because of all of these eight uh, uh, divine mysteries and two satanic ones, he's the one that received most of these, not all, but most of them. So coming down to verse um, 5, he points out, the mystery was not revealed in the past. It was not revealed in the Hebrew Bible. And that's why it became known as a mystery. And in verse 6, he finally points out what the content of the mystery is. And the content is that Jewish and Gentile believers are united into one body. And such a, the fact of Jewish and Gentile salvation is not the mystery that was already known in the Hebrew Bible, but what is new now is that Jewish believers and Gentile believers are now united into this one body. The, the Kehillah, the Ecclesia, the body of the Messiah, or in English, the church. And uh, therefore, this one entity is also the one new man of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. 
And in verse seven, Paul became a minister of the mystery. In verse eight, Paul has become the apostle of the mystery. A minister because he functions in the revelations that God has revealed about the mysteries, and he's also the apostle of the uh, of the uh, mystery, because uh, only the others, only one or two, had received information about uh, the mystery of the New Testament. But he received the most revelation about the mysteries of the New Testament, and. He became therefore both a minister and apostle to the mysteries. As we come to verse nine, his goal is to make all men see what what is the um, dispensation of the mystery. He's propagating it as he's doing in these epistles. And in verse 10, he finally lays down the object and the purpose of his own calling. That, and that is that the principalities and powers of the heavenly places might know the manifold wisdom of God. This could be the holy angels, it could also be the fallen angels who also reside in the heavenly places, not the heaven of heavens, but in the atmospheric heavens. And, and these, and these uh, mysteries reveal to the principalities and powers of the heavenly places, both the holy angels and the fallen angels, as they see how God's plan is working its way out in the history of Israel and also in the development of this new age, the age of the church. And so in verse 11, it was part of God's eternal purpose, probably now being revealed. And in verse 12, he concludes with that he's fully confident in proclaiming the mystery. And so this mystery, again, is the union of Jewish believers and Gentile believers into one body. So before the birth and the development of this mystery, there were two, uh, there were two basic entities, Jews and Gentiles. But now we have a third entity, a third entity consisting of believers only, and so all Jews who believe are members of this unique new entity, the body of the Messiah, and also all Gentile believers have become members uniquely of this special body. And so that is the mystery now being revealed, and this was nowhere indicated in the Hebrew Bible. The fact that both Jews and Gentiles will be saved is not the mystery. That they'll be united into a third new entity, that is the mystery. Let's go on to the third church ministry and let's go to Colossians chapter one. And now we come to verses 24 through 29. Now verse 24, notice, Paul rejoiced in his affliction because he was suffering for the sake of Messiah's body. And Messiah's body is the church, the, the Kela, the Ecclesia, the, the new union of Jewish and Gentile believers. And so in verse 25, Paul's ministry is a ministry according to the dispensation of God. And the issue of the new body, the church, focuses uh, develops in this particular dispensation. And so this is the same as the dispensation of grace in Ephesians chapter three, verse two, is also the same as the dispensation of the mystery in Ephesians chapter three, verse nine. As we come to verse 26, we have the revelation of the mystery. And notice the difference between the past and the future. In the past, knowledge of these mysteries has been hidden for ages and generations. But that was in the past. And so the mysteries would not be known anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. But now at the present time, only now has it been manifested to the saints. as being manifested by the New Testament apostles and New Testament prophets. And, um, and this is uniquely a revelation only given by the pages of the Greek New Testament. As we come to verse 27, he provides the object and the content of this mystery. The object, 
to make it known among the Gentiles. And so part of his ministry is to let the Gentile believers who are coming to the faith to understand the nature of this specific ministry, which is going to be the ministry of the indwelling spirit. And the content, Messiah in you, the hope of glory. Now the Holy Spirit indwelling believers is not the, is not the mystery. In the Hebrew Bible, the Spirit indwelled some believers, but not all believers. And furthermore, the indwelling of the Spirit was not necessarily permanent. And so uh, David prayed, take not your Holy Spirit from me. But with the New Testament, beginning in Acts 2, the Spirit now indwelled all believers, but the principle of indwelling is not the mystery. It's already been revealed in the Hebrew Bible. The mystery, as he points out in verse 27, is this. The fact that the Messiah indwells every believer. And while the Hebrew Bible said many things about what the Messiah's ministry will be, it never stated that he'll also indwell the believer in the same way the Spirit indwells the believer. But here we now see that the Messiah also indwells every believer as well. And that is the mystery unrevealed anywhere in the Old Testament. And within the book of Colossians, this will lead to five elaborations. Now the first elaboration is spiritual growth. It provides a means of spiritual maturity that was uh, only achieved by some in the Hebrew Bible, but now it's available to all believers if they discipline themselves in the study of the scriptures and elements involved of that nature. Secondly, he points out in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, in him, meaning in the Messiah, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So within the Messiah, you have also the work of God the Father and the work of the Spirit. And it was all in him bodily. And now he also indwells us. And so we are receiving the ministry not only of the indwelling of the Spirit, but also the indwelling of the Father and the Son within the body of the Messiah. And so and this indwelling is true of every believer, and that happens because of the Messiah being in us. The third element in chapter 3, verse 3 of Colossians. You died, and your life is hid with Messiah in God. And it's a positional truth. When he died, we died. When he was resurrected, we were resurrected. This is a positional truth that's not, if we're living, we haven't yet experienced it, but we will, unless the rapture comes in our own lifetime. But um, the fact that uh, he's already indwelling us and, and pointing this out more than once, that we are now experiencing a new type of availability of spiritual maturity. It's available to every believer, but every believer must needs be self-disciplined not to only attend services to be taught, but to study uh, his or her own scriptures and see what else we can learn. Then the fourth element, the timing of the final revelation will be at the second coming in chapter three, verse four. So only with the second coming will people recognize as fully as um, he was recognized that we have the indwelling spirit, we have come to the status of spiritual maturity, and we um, at the second coming, when we shall return with the Messiah to this earth, they will see a glorified state. And so what they do not see now, they will see in the future. And then fifthly, the final goal is in chapter 3, verse 11. Messiah is all and in all. And we'll see the glorified Messiah and the status he has achieved. So that is the third specific ministry uh, mystery involved with the church. Now going down on the, it should be on the back page now, capital D, the mystery of the bride of the Messiah. And now let's turn to the next passage, Ephesians chapter 5.
This is verses 22 through 33. The mystery of the church as the bride of the Messiah. He begins with a basic principle in verse 22. The wife should be in subjection to the husband as she would be in subjection to God. And a way of showing subjection to God is by showing subjection to the husband. And the means of... Um, being a subjection to husband is also the means of also being a subjection to God. Then in verse uh, 23, he makes a comparison but also a contrast. The comparison, the husband is the head of the wife just as the Messiah is the head of the church. That's the basic theology of the New Testament. But the contrast is, the Messiah is the savior of the body. The husband cannot be the savior of the wife in the sense of salvation. But he should be willing to protect his wife even at the cost of his own life. And so that is the contrast. What Messiah accomplished results in eternal salvation. And what the husband accomplishes is protection, and of allowing for development, obviously um, he will not be able to die in the sense of serving his wife with salvation. That's going to be based upon her own belief and faith. But he must be willing to give up his own life if it means to protect the life of his wife. In verse 24 comes the comparison, another comparison. The church is subject to the Messiah. And the fact that the church, which is the bride of the Messiah, is in subjection to the Messiah, so the wife should be in subjection to the husband. And, uh, and that's in everything he points out, unless it violates a biblical imperative. So the wife, if the husband begins to ask his wife to do things which contradict scripture that she cannot obey. And when the Sanhedrin telling Peter that he must not continue preaching on any resurrection of the Messiah, Peter responded, we must obey God rather than men. It's one thing to be in subjection to, people, to authorities over us. If they do not violate scripture, but as soon as they do violate scripture, at that point we must desist and, and reject following that system. So the point here in verse uh, 23 um, and verse 24, just as the church is subject to the Messiah, the wife should be in subjection to her husband in everything until it violates a clear biblical imperative. But it must be a clear biblical imperative, not what we feel may or may not be right. In verse 25, there's another comparison and a contrast, a comparison. Messiah loved the church, therefore husbands ought to love their wives. Now saying loving their wives and love them into subjection, this, is, this does not mean we, have, we force our wives into subjection. But the principle is we are to love our wives into subjection. That because of the way we show love for the spouse, by the same token, they respond accordingly. That's the comparison, but the contrast. Messiah died for the church for the sake of salvation. And again, the husband cannot give himself, love, um, give himself up for his wife in that salvation sense. If we die, that doesn't save the wife. But we can do so in a loving and professional sense. And we must even be willing to give up our lives on her behalf. And... Um, that's how far we can go. But the Messiah only went, only he went one step further, providing salvation for the other side. Now verse 26 and 27, he deals with Messiah's present and future purpose for the bride of the Messiah. And in verse 26, the present purpose to sanctify the church, to set the church apart in the means is by the washing of the word of God the washing with the water of the word of God. The means by which we are washed and the means by which we continue to mature 
cannot be rel cannot be limited to meetings we go to. Those meetings, like in the congregation here, that's how we learn to do things. But then we're responsible for our own each of our own Bible studies. And some can have time to do more, some can uh, have time to do less, but there's nobody can say, I don't have a minute to study the Bible. And that will show, uh, that will show a lack of maturity. So it's by, it is by means of the washing of the Word of God and understanding which scriptures apply to us and which scriptures do not apply to us. For example, in the Torah, God said, if you are obedient, to the Torah, you will not suffer persecution. But that's a promise for Israel. He did not make the same uh, promise for the body of the for the bride of the Messiah. But he says, if you will, if you will live righteously, you will suffer persecution. Exact opposite between what he promised Israel, what he promised as members of the body of the Messiah, and that's what we need to keep in mind. So the present purpose is to sanctify the church, to bring her in the, in the set of spiritual maturity. But the future purpose is in verse 27, to present the church a glorious church. No spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing. And so, to be holy without blemish. Now the... Um, and what that means from other passages is in 2 Corinthians 11 verses 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 1 and 2, to present the church as a pure virgin. In Revelation chapter 19 verses 6 to 8, Revelation 19, 6 to 8, the bride will be dressed in wedding garments. But the, then he defines those what, what these garments are, the righteous acts of the saints. So as we stand before the judgment seat of the Messiah, whether we're caught up uh, being resurrected or caught up alive, we'll stand before that judgment. And the purpose of the judgment is not whether we're saved or not. That's already determined once we believe. But the purpose of that judgment seat is determine how we serve the Lord since we believed. And so all the wood, hay, stubble will be burned away. And all the gold, precious stones, and silver will be purified. Well, that will then determine our special position in the Messianic kingdom. But every believer will go into the kingdom. And every believer is part of the bride. And all that will be showing are the righteous acts of the saints. And among those would be some who received certain positions of authority because of how they served the Lord. And so this is, um, this is what the wedding garment will be. Now in verses 28 through 30, you have some other comparisons. First of all, in verse 28, a comparison of love. Husbands are to love their own wives as their own bodies. And... Um, just as Messiah loves his own body, and that body is the church. Colossians 1.18. And the only one who truly loves his wife will truly love himself. That's verse 28. Now moving down to verse 29, the principle of maturation or maturity. The basic fact is no man ever hates his own flesh, and the wife is his own flesh. He nourishes and cherishes uh, his own flesh. The word nourish means to build up or to bring to completion. And to cherish is to provide tender loving care. So just as the Messiah nourishes and cherishes the church to bring her to completion. Now what that, how we, what that, uh, but he's teaching about the application to our human uh, mate. That as we marry a woman, we should also become a student of our wife. What are her, what her, what her strong points? If she's very good at mathematics, she could probably keep the finances of the book into balance. Or if she's musically oriented, you, uh, uh, provide with them musical lessons to mature in the musical instrument that she could play, 
and often it could be more than one musical instrument, we should do everything we can to make sh to give the wife the opportunity to be able to increase her strengths and be able to understand how to do certain things of that nature. And we should bring her to completion in the same way as the Messiah is bringing the church to completion. So in verse 30, he provides the basis, our membership in the body. Messiah is nourishing and cherishing his body, which is the church, and the husband must also nourish and cherish his body, which is the wife. And so, and so this is the issue that's involved here. As we come to verse 31, what he does is quote Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, the, husband, the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his own wife. So the husband is to love and nourish and cherish his wife, and to love, not to hate his own flesh. And finally in verse 32, he tells us the content of this specific mystery. The declaration is, the mystery is great. Then the clarification, I speak in regard of Messiah and his church. Now in the Hebrew Bible and into the Greek New Testament, we read of Israel being the wife of Yahweh, the, the wife of Jehovah. So this is not the mystery that's already well revealed. The mystery is that the church is the bride of the Messiah. So Israel is the wife of God the Father, now divorced ultimately to be reunited after a national salvation. But the church is the bride and um, specifically of uh, God the Son. And that's the distinction. That's the, that's the mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament, that the, the bride of the, that the um, body of the Messiah also becomes the wife of the Messiah. At this point, we throw it. In the future, there'll be a wedding service, and that's gonna happen in, be, in uh, preparation for the Messianic Kingdom. And then he draws his conclusion in verse 33, for the husband, love your wife as you love yourself. For the wife, let the wife see that she fear or respect her husband. And that's the fourth mystery involving the church. There's one more, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15 verses 50 to 58 deal with the mystery of the translation. I will not discuss everything about what, the, what we call the rapture of the body and the bride of the Messiah. That would take its own separate study altogether. But we're going to focus only on the facet of the mystery. So in verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So the kind of bodies we now have, bodies subject to mortality, so bodies subject to corruption, are not the kind of bodies with which we need to, can enter into the eternal state. And therefore there must needs be a change in the nature of our human bodies. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. There's the word. And the mystery is defi defining here. Cannot be the same as the second coming. We have a lot more details about the second coming in the Hebrew Bible than we have in the um, New Testament. So the second coming cannot be the mystery. But rather, the mystery is about, he's about to explain, and we already looked at our first session a few months ago, I guess now, that um, the, the fact that anything that is a mystery has not been revealed in the Hebrew Bible. So the second coming, a lot of revelation. As far as the rapture, no revelation. That comes only now in the New Testament. So back to verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery, we all shall not sleep, 
but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incredible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying, is written, death is wrought up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And so on to the end of the chapter. So what we learn about the mystery here is that a time is coming when a whole generation of believers will enter into a state of immortality without first passing through physical death. So for the believers who have already died, they, will be, they have already suffered corruption in the body, but now corruption puts on incorruption. And those of us living in mortal bodies, if this event happens in our lifetime, mortality puts on immortality. And so this final mystery concerning the church, there's going to be a generation of believers who enter into eternity without experiencing physical, without physical death. And the timing of it is in connection at the time of the rapture of the body and the bride of the Messiah. Let me just clarify one thing. We talks about the last trump. Some identified the last trump with the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11. And uh, therefore, whenever the last trump is, that will be the seventh trumpet. And both mid-trips and post-trips do take the same view. They just disagree among themselves whether the rapture is at the midpoint or at the post-point. But that cannot be what, the, what this is about. Now keep in mind that this is an epistle being written to the Corinthian church. And at this point, there's been no, no interpretation of what the seven trumpets are. That will be, that's only revealed finally in, the, in the, the book of Revelation. And the last trump is not the, uh, is the, is the, uh, the, the uh, seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation, but not the trumpets that are blown on the Feast of First Fruits and so on. And therefore, when he, what he's pointing out is that this, uh, the seven trumpets which the Corinthians couldn't read about because the book of Revelation was uh, written somewhere between A.D. 90 and 95. So when the Corinthian leaders of this congregation looked at this verse and what they could not do is raise the question, what in the world does Paul mean by the last trump? And what they could not do is pull out the book of Revelation and turn to chapter 11 and say, well, this must be it. There was no book of Revelation yet. There won't be for about 30 more years. So he's referring to something that is else. Now in the book of Leviticus chapter 23, Paul outlined the seven holy seasons and um, provided the chronological sequence of the seven holy seasons to be observed. He doesn't provide all of the details. Those details are found elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible. But he just simply um, points out, this is the order by which they are to be observed. And while there are seven altogether, they're grouped in two separate cycles. The first cycle is the spring cycle that contains the first four, and the first four are fulfilled by the program of the first coming. And they all fall in, the, in about 50 days of each other. So the feast of Passover, fulfilled by the death of the Messiah, and, the, and then the feast of uh, first fruits, offered by the selflessness of his blood. And then you have the feast of, um, the feast of, uh, for, uh, the first fruits, the Passover, and the, I'm sorry, the second feast, the feast of unleavened bread, that emphasizes the sinlessness of his blood. Then the feast of first fruits, that um, is fulfilled by his resurrection. And then you have a four month break. But then comes the second cycle, the fall cycle, the, and those last three festivities all come within two weeks of each other, much closer. 
And these are the feasts of um, trumpets, the, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of, of um, Tabernacles. Now the Feast of uh, Trumpets is, uh, happens before the Day of Atonement. And the Feast of Trumpets is what will fulfill, as we'll see in a moment, the um, a specific uh, fulfillment of this particular trumpet he's talking about in the Corinthian letter. And then the Feast of uh, Sukkot, or the Tabernacles, is fulfilled by the Messianic Kingdom. So, and within this book already, he's already listed and dealt with not all seven holy seasons, but most of them. Go back to chapter 5 for a moment. For a moment. And notice in um, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 and 7, in verse 5 and 6, he deals with the Passover. And then in verse 8, he deals with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In chapters 11 through 14, he deals with the, uh, with the, with the seven feet, no, deals with the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And, and in moving over to chapter 15, in verses 20 to 24, he deals with the Feast of First Fruits. And um, at the end of this chapter, with the Feast of Trumpets. So what does he mean by the last trump? Again, it cannot refer to the seventh trumpet of Revelation. The book had not yet been written. But it does refer to the actual ritual of the Feast of Trumpets where you, uh, uh, you blow specifically seven trumpet sounds. Uh, but, uh, but they're broken up into different parts. So although the, the specific different um, notes like short, long, and staccato, when you count up all the notes, it's exactly 100 notes. And the last note, the tekiak dolam, is the longest note. It's as long as the blower can hold his breath. And in Judaism, when they define what this last trump is, it represents the resurrection of Israel and the inauguration of the Messianic Kingdom. Now notice in this context we just looked at, Paul picks up the, res the resurrection motif that Judaism teaches, but he applies it more specifically on the resurrection of the body and the translation of the body at the time the rapture occurs, and that's the focus. And so this is a time when there'll be all believers will simply be translated, and those already dead will be resurrected. So this is the mystery of the translation, and this is an event that is still awaiting to happen. So these are the five specific elements in the, of the church. Each of them are relevant to us today. We have two more sessions someday that will be scheduled. The next one is the, the mystery of Israel's hardening, and then we'll deal with the two, with the final Eighth divine mysteries that will then conquer the two satanic mysteries.